well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we know that we changed the location, so it's a new place for us, but we'll return back next time, back to the Graduate Center. Um, for those who are new to this seminar series um, or industrial speaker series, just to say a few words that um, twice or three times a year we run this industry speakers panel. Um, and this is organized by our department, um, accounting and financial management, all our member of staffs here, including myself. And we join this, uh, do this in partnership with Graham, with the PQ magazine. And you all um, hopefully have subscribed to the magazine as well to see hear more news about accountancy, finance, all the exams and whatnot, right? So, um, yes, we very, um, very lucky to have you all today here because it's a Wednesday evening. Most of our students are um, at sports fixtures, I know that. So for the first years, though, for, this is new for you, right? First time, you've just only been a couple of weeks here in the university. So um, you'll, you'll kind of get to know this series and it's really quite, you know, uh, beneficial for a first year students, especially those who are new. In the last year, students have gave us feedback about the seminar series. Those who especially coming from those backgrounds, your parents may not have been accountants or may not have really joined or went to university or been in a business school. For them, it's it's good opportunity to talk to people who work in the industry um, that helps you to kind of, you know, to network with them, get to know them, also inspire you to develop a passion for accountancy and especially um, Queen Mary's commitment to support social mobility and diversity background students and staff here at Queen Mary. Also, we've got some few visitors from external other institutions. You are welcome and I hope you enjoy tonight. And a big question, really, the ethical accountant, how do we create the honest accountant? This, been, this has been a long journey for us. Um, I'm sure some of the colleagues here knows that first time we introduced our first uh, a program in accountancy was in, was in 2016. So it's been a long journey, but we are trying hard. We are working hard and um, we're working on this. So um, I'm, without further delays, I'm going to hand over to Graham. Graham is going to introduce all the speakers to you tonight. And a special thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for your time and um, um, being here. And um, we hope that you enjoy as well talking to our students. So thanks again for coming. Thank you, Sean. So um, my big question is, um, how did you all celebrate Global Ethics Day on the 18th of October? Did you all know that was? Hopefully you were all really ethical to one day only in the year. <laughs> well, um, the Chartered Accountants Worldwide Organization produced a new report on that day called Trust, Making a Difference. It said that after two centuries of business, the accountancy profession still believes in accuracy, quality, integrity, and that's an important word, Ethics, acting in the public interest and being worthy of trust. The world of business is ever changing and evolving and the rise of generative AI and the influx of data and what it means to you means having reliable, trustworthy financial information is at a premium. How the profession has worked hard to earn trust but it must now work harder to maintain it. Now, there is some good news. I, I was going to say there's some good news out there and talk about that, but has anyone actually read the Institute's Code of Ethics for Professional Accounts yet? I'm sure it's on your... Is there are people with their hands up. You, how many... Thank you. How many... He'll talk about it later. How many, do you know how many pages it is? It's 375 pages. Um, and, and, I, you know, I'm... I'm not sure many people will ever read it again after reading it once. But before you start reading it, um, the latest Elderman Trust Barometer reveals there's been a significant increase in trust in chart accountants. Hey, looks like we don't have to do anything. Um, according to them, trust in chart accountants is at 85%. And that's despite all the ongoing economic uncertainty and everything around that. Now, so how does that work out? So you've got trust in accounts, that's up seven percentage points in two years. That makes accounts as trusted as, well, doctors are 87, engineers are 87. And let's put it into context. 
Let's look at the lawyers. The lawyers fell by 3% and they're at 64. Auditors, and um, I think one of our first speakers is, is going to talk about that. They're at 75%. And politicians, where do you think they are? 10%. Out of 100, remember? What do you think? 27%. And that's wonderful journalists, we're there. 43%. So I, I think for me, um, this was, was a subject we talked about in, in, in the first series and whether we should talk about ethics. It's, a, it's quite a complicated and intricate subject because um, we all think we're ethical people. We all think we have morals. But um, when it comes to business, you as accountants are going to be put in a very, very interesting position. You're gonna have control of the money, you're gonna have control of lots of things that can have real influence on people's lives. And, and how you affect that, and how you change that, and how you take that responsibility is really important. And we were, we were outside, we were having a discussion about, do we all have a price? What's the price? You know, what, what, how much would you need to be paid to do something wrong? Um, I'm sure it's a conversation you might have in the pub or somewhere else, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a really serious one for business and for us as, as people and how we want to be viewed. Um, but So I, I think this is a really important topic is what I'm saying. So, and so the best thing to do is get some people who actually know about it rather than me and get them to talk about it. Because remember, only 43% of you trust me anyway. <laughs> um, so let's get someone with, you know, you trust, a, you know, a chartered account, 85% trust rating. Let's get one of those. So we've got a fantastic panel today. Um, unfortunately, we did have um, someone from my address, um, Martin McBreen, was going to come as well, but she had to drop out at late notice. So we, we do try to make sure that the panel is properly reflected, but um, unfortunately, she couldn't come tonight. She's very busy. Apparently, they've got lots of things to talk about. So um, but first up, we're going to have Paul, who is a partner on sustainability reporting and assurance at Mazars. Fantastic firm. You do not have to go to the Big Four to get a fantastic career. Mazars is the place to go. So if, if, grab him afterwards and find out how you get a job. He is the man to know. Then we're going to have Gareth Moss, who is an FD at SIPA. Um, and so he's actually running a professional council body I think um, I did look at that. So it's interesting, the trust in chartered accounts and bodies rose 3% in between 2021 and 2023, you'd be pleased to know. And you're now 80% trusted. Well, that's good. It still means one in five people don't trust you, if that's okay to say. Then we're going to have Professor Atul K. Shah, who is a founder and CEO of Diverse Ethics. He's going to give you, I think, a very interesting sort of counter view of maybe of, of where we where we are and then we're going to end up with Stephen Kite and he's a chain consultant who is former head of learning in firm at Crow UK and KPMG and we've known each other a long time and I think he's going to make the evening really really interesting so that's me I'm going to get out of the way and hand over to the experts so thank you all for coming and I'll speak to you soon Thanks very much, Graham. Um, I think Stephen and I go back even farther than the two of you, given that we worked together in the Big Four, I have to confess, uh, way back in the 1990s. So there you go. And talking in the 1990s, I love this lecture theatre, chalkboards. That's what they were like when I went to university an awful long time ago. Um, so yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Graham. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a partner in sustainability reporting and assurance since September. Before that, I was in uh, audit methodology and audit technical. I uh, moved into sustainability because why wouldn't you? It's the big game in town right now. Um, I'll just give you a bit of background about myself um, before I start. Um, then I'll talk through an overview of the ethical standards, what they are and how they fit together. And then just some of, the, some of my thoughts on the impact of ethics on the accounting profession, different parts of the profession. So accountants in business, auditors, tax, they're always dodgy. Uh, this has been recorded, I'm going to be careful. Um, and then touch on sustainability because that is the new thing um, at the moment. So a little bit about myself, talking about social mobility, which was um, mentioned at the beginning. So you probably hear from my accent, it's softer than it used to be. But I'm originally from up north, so I grew up in Bolton, cotton mill territory. 
Um, my family were all cotton mill workers and I've, I've done the family tree during COVID because there was nothing else to do. Uh, and found out that actually we go back generations after generations after generations where everybody works in the cotton mills. Uh, I was the first one to go to university in the entire family and 30 odd years on, I'm still the last one to go to university in my family. Um, so what did I go to university to do? The second picture up there is, uh, is rocks. So I went to university to do geology. How on earth did I end up where I am today, I wonder. Um, so I came out of university in the early 90s um, and the, that time, oil price disastrous, needed to get a job, and I ended up going into audit, at which point I knew absolutely nothing about accountancy or about audit. Um, and I actually thought, you know, I suspect the first years amongst you might still think this, but when an auditor does an audit, I thought that we audited to the penny. And then I found this wonderful concept of materiality where, for example, Birmingham City Council, as long as their accounts are within 45 million, that's okay. Um, we don't tend to tell the taxpayers that. So, um, so I went into public sector audits, I'm SIP for qualified, uh, working with KPMG, moved to PwC, um, and spent about 20 years doing public sector audit. I then moved into a, a range of technical roles, so there's the, the bottom left picture is the wonderful international um, auditing standards book, right, that thick, it's a great read. Um, so I moved into a, a bunch of technical roles uh, within Grant Thornton and within the public sector. I then moved to Grant Thornton International, where I spent three years developing their global audit methodology. Then Baker Tilly International, where I was a global director of professional standards, um, doing a lot of things around um, methodology and technical support, but also global ethics and independence. So the ethics thing started to kick in. Um, I also worked for the UK member firm of Baker Tilly, where I was ethics partner for about 12 months. Um, more of that in a little while, maybe. Um, and then about 18 months ago, I moved to Mazars uh, in a technical role. So I moved around quite a bit, and we were saying upstairs, so I'm sit for qualified, and I thought a good number of years ago that I'd boxed myself into a corner that I couldn't get out of. And since then, the last 10 years, you know, I've been all around the world, and I've been, been very, very fortunate. Places, when I was growing up next to the cotton mills, I never thought I would get to see. So it's a great profession. It'll give you a great career and I hope it'll be as good as the one I've enjoyed. So ethical standards then. Um, what, what are ethical standards? Very quick overview. Um, so IESBA, the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, um, publishes the international ethical standards um, and they're really public interest is everything, everything accountants do uh, and everything auditors do is in the public interest. So the ethical standards have been written um, with the public interest in mind and really to enhance public trust and, and it's good that we've had the percentage figures. It's a bit disappointing that auditors are less than chartered accountants, but there you go, you can't have everything in life. Um, but it's all about enhancing public trust in, in financial and non-financial information that increasingly important with sustainability. The international standards have been adopted in 130 countries, so we do have a truly global baseline for ethical standards. Um, and I, I think they're unique. I've not done a tremendous amount of research in this to prove that it's unique, but um, I, I believe that we've got a unique set of international ethical standards. I look at, um, I'm a geologist, as you know, so I'm also a member of the Fellow of the, Ge a fellow of the Geological Society, which is a professional body here, uh, and I, I did pull the numbers out. So the, the Geological Society Ethics Code has got 601 words. The European Geologist one has 513 words, so they have a bit less. And, and this has already been said, the ICAW is 370 odd pages. And on top of that, for us auditors, we also have the lovely FRC ethical standard, which gives us another 100 plus pages. So we do have a hell of a baseline when it comes to ethical standards. And in terms of UK ethical codes, I mentioned the FRC, but the institutes as well, all have their own professional codes that are built on the ISB standard and consistent with it and, and tend to have other things added. What are the fundamental principles for all accountants? And, and I think often um, the ethical standard gets thought of as something for auditors. Uh, it is for every single accountant. Um, so integrity, what's that mean? Being straightforward and honest, standing your ground, challenging other people. That can be very difficult. So I mentioned I was an ethics partner, and I just gave this example upstairs as well. Um, so I'd wanted to be an ethics partner for some reason for many years when I was at Grant Thornton, it never happened. Uh, and when I eventually got the job um, in my previous firm, um, part of the role was the ethics partner, so I was quite excited. And it lasted about a year before, unfortunately I had a bit of a disagreement with the firm's management board who on two particular issues I didn't think were being especially ethical. Uh, at which point I had to stand my ground and do the right thing. Um, and I tried to persuade them to do the right thing themselves, but ultimately I ended up having to resign as the ethics partner from that firm, which was, for me, a really bad place to be. 
Um, but it was the right thing to do. Um, ultimately, obviously, once you've gone up against the management board and you've resigned as ethics partner, you don't last much longer. So I moved on fairly quickly to Mazars. But, but that was very, very difficult because that was a role I'd really wanted. I could have backed down. I could have worked out what my price was. My price could have been, I've always wanted to be ethics partner. I'm going to carry on. But the, the integrity, was there's just no way I could do that. Um, also with integrity, it's, it's not being knowingly associated with misleading information, either false information or stuff that you leave out so that nobody sees it, which we'll come on to some examples later. Objectivity is all about avoiding bias, and it's about, from an auditor's perspective in particular, about being independent, but not just being independent, but being seen to be independent. So we can sit here as auditors saying, yes, we're independent, but we need to prove that we're independent. You need to see us as being independent, and often that's not the case. Due care and competence is about having the right skills and knowledge and keeping up to date with those skills and knowledge and CPE, which again I'll touch on in a little while. And professional behaviour is a really interesting one because this is about complying with laws and regulations, acting in the public interest, but also doing nothing, even in your private life, that might bring the profession into disrepute. Um, and there were some examples earlier I won't go into because they're not mine. But things that people do in their private life can actually bring the profession into disrepute and can end up losing your membership of the institute that you're a member of as well. So professional behaviour isn't just between nine and five and when you've got your suit on, um, it's also um, during your daily life. So professional accountants in business. So the biggest ethics issue is auditors, right? That's what everybody always says. Auditors are unethical, they get too many non-audit non fees, blah, 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 blah. Auditors bad, 75% trust. That's wrong. Actually, in my view, uh, I would say that 30 years as an auditor. But the biggest ethical issue we have in accountancy is when accountants commit fraud. I mean, if you think about it logically, an auditor can't not find a fraud if a fraud doesn't exist. So the fraud has to happen first before we get involved and we do get things wrong from time to time. Um, so, so I actually think the biggest ethics issue is, is fraud in the first place that's committed. And it's also important, I think, to remember that's not always for personal gain. So one of the Examples in my career, I've not had many frauds, maybe I've missed them, um, that we've discovered during my career, but there was one where it was a, an NHS trust, director of finance, he received the district valuers report in a spreadsheet, it's last century by the way, received the district valuers report in a spreadsheet, manipulated the numbers in the report for the valuation, PDF'd it and sent it to the auditor. Now the auditor should get it direct, different question. Um, but basically all he was trying to do then was present the results of the NHS trust in a more favourable light. He gained nothing from it and in actual fact he lost three years of his life in jail just after his wife had had a baby. So uh, it's not all necessarily about um, Bankman Freed or whatever he's called, nicking billions of pounds. It can be things that you're trying to do for the best reasons that just backfire and go horribly wrong. <clears throat> and that, that case definitely was. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath. So I was sat in a, a round table with I. Esber a couple of years ago when we were looking at what can we do to you know, improve ethics and, and accountants. Um, and one of the things I suggested was we should have some sort of overarching oath. You know, so you, in the medical profession, you've got the first do no harm. So I came up with first do no fraud, because if you do no fraud, I can't fail to find it. Suits me as an auditor, suits everybody. It didn't make its way into the ethical standard, unfortunately. But I think there is something about having some form of overarching statement that I think would be really useful. And in terms of the question at the beginning, what more can be done? I think um, in terms of professional accountants in business, from my perspective, there's not as much profile for ethics as for accountants as there is ethics for auditors. My wife's uh, an accountant. She won't, hopefully won't mind me telling you this, but she's been qualified 25 years. Um, and when I started talking about ethics a few years ago, she looked at me blankly and I said, you know the, the ethics code? She looked at me blankly again. And I said, have you had any ethics training since you qualified? No. So I think what institutes could do much more of, I think, is raising the profile of ethics in professional accountants in business. The ICAW have made the move to require all accountants to have at least an hour of ethics training in their CPE every year. So that's great. That's a good start. But I think a lot more can be done, particularly around bias. And there's some really good stuff out there. The ACCA <clears throat> did a great report in 2017 on bias. They've just done another one on bias and, and um, sustainability as well. So I think that's, that's the focus for accountants. Um, for auditors then, so why, why is, in, and, and for auditors it tends to focus on independence, why? because we need to be independent and be seen to be independent of our clients or audited entities as I should call them. 
So why is independent audit so important? So there's a few things I've got here. The first is, and, and this is the classic example, it's important for the function of capital markets. Um, you know, all the, the public interest audits, the listed entity audits, they're seen as the, the crux of audit because capital markets keeps the world spinning. Um, so clearly, functioning capital markets are very important. But equally, as the, the small and medium enterprises on a managed business sector, which firms like Mazars and Crow, where Stephen was, um, focus a lot of time and effort on as well, because actually the SME sector is the, the, the workforce. It's a, the vast majority of the mo most economies in the world. So capital markets are very important, but the SME sector is absolutely critical as well. Public sector, where I spent all of my audit career, and there's three sit for people here today. Um, I've got a colleague who claims, possibly exaggerated, that if there wasn't public sector audit, we would see the end of civilization as we know it. Now, but her argument goes, we audit the taxpayers' money, which is why I quite liked public sector when I went into audit, and that's why I went into the sector. We're auditing taxpayers' money and the use of taxpayers' money. If there's no trust in taxpayers, the use of taxpayers' money, we'll all stop paying tax, ergo, the end of civilization. So possibly exaggerated, but, um, but that's why we do what we do in the public sector. And in terms of charities, I think it's really important to users of charities and to people who donate money to charities and, and grant paying bodies as well, that charities have an independent audit. So there's a picture of me smiling in a radio studio here. The story behind that was, um, as part of my previous job, I was in Ecuador and invited to be interviewed live on radio, in Spanish, I don't speak Spanish, um, in, in Ecuador, and it was a, a religious um, radio station. So I did the interview about audit, and uh, had a translator, obviously, um, helping me out. And then after we'd finished the interview, they said, right, now we'll just play some adverts, and then we'll go to the audience for questions, at which point I burst out laughing. It's like, nobody, <laughs> nobody is going to ring in to a Christian radio station in the middle of Quito to talk to me about audit. That's just not going to happen. We've got four questions. Couldn't believe it. And basically the gist of those questions was all about how important it is to have an independent audit of local churches and local charities. So even in Quito, it really matters. Um, a few examples of what, what happens when things go wrong in audit. Um, the first one um, last year, I think it was, number of partners and employees cheating in exams and training courses, mostly in the US, it's spread around the world a little bit. Um, that's bad enough, that, that lacks integrity if you're going to cheat in your exams, let's face it. But what made it worse was it was the ethics exam. So, um, <laughs> kind of unforgivable, uh, to say the very least. Um, in terms of non-audit services, that's the classic. Everybody always says, oh, auditors do too much non-audit work and they get too many fees. I think that's more perception than reality in a lot of cases. But I, I will say that I'm not going to give any examples, but I have seen instances in my career where probably the auditors took a slightly different view because they got a nice big juicy consultancy contract. So it does happen, but not as often as I think the press might like to make out. Another issue is long association, familiarity. I had a classic case um, in my previous firm where we'd done a piece of non-audit work on, on the share ownership. And I said to the partner, can you show me the work you've done? And there, was, there wasn't any, really, much evidence of work. And, and he said, well, I don't really need to do that. He said, because you know, I've been there audit for 25 years and I know them really well and I, I don't need to know who owns the shares because I just know it because I know them so well. Thankfully, he stopped short of saying I play golf with him every Saturday and I'm godfather to his children. But the fact that he'd been there audit for 25 years kind of rang even more alarm bells in my mind. Professional behaviour, not many examples, thankfully, um, around professional behaviour and issues around that. But there were the classic um, KPMG, Carillion, um, Examples recently where KPMG was accused of misleading, lying to even the regulator, which is clearly bringing themselves and the profession into disrepute. And also just generally, I don't know if you read any of it, go and have a look at some of the summaries, generally the behaviour of the team and the partner washing their hands of all responsibility. I had nothing to do with that problem, I was off shopping with my wife. Well, that doesn't help, it makes it sound a whole lot worse. Um, challenge, scepticism and bias. Bias keeps coming back, I mentioned it earlier on. Bias is a massive issue. Auditors don't necessarily challenge management enough, and I think this about applying scepticism, that, although part of audit methodology is really goes down to the crux of ethics and the integrity piece. Um, in terms of integrity, uh, another example from my career, uh, where I had a, a case where we'd done the audit one year, um, I was told by our technical team to back down and accept what the client said, so I did. Following year, slightly different circumstances, and I said, I'm not doing that this year. I'm standing my ground this time. I don't care what the technical team says, this is wrong. To make it more difficult, it was an NHS trust, so the FD was sat there saying to me, 
But Paul, if you make me do this, that means X number of people can't have their hip replacements and poor old granny's gonna be in pain and X number of children can't have this operation and all the rest of it. So again, really difficult to stand up to somebody in that situation, thankfully I did. Um, we ended up, they did end up changing the account, but ironically afterwards he got psyched because of what he'd done, um, or tried to do. But ironically, he then rang me up and said, would you mind giving me a reference because I really admire the way you handled that situation. So standing up to people doesn't always backfire. Um, and client confidentiality is also critical. There was an example, um, and this is a little bit of that outside of work thing I mentioned, of a guy who was in a WhatsApp conversation with his wife and his wife's friend worked for an audit client and his wife's friend mentioned to her that he was being made redundant. And in this WhatsApp conversation, our manager went back and said, well, that's weird because there's nothing about redundancies during the audit, at which his wife forwarded it to the guy who was being made redundant. He went back to the client and started to complain. And that guy on the, what, on the face of it felt like an innocent WhatsApp conversation ended up going through disciplinary with the ICAW. So you do need to be mindful at all times about how easy it is to fall foul of confidentiality. Tax, I mentioned tax. Um, tax planning in particular. You know, there's a high profile case of Starbucks and the rest of them that don't pay any tax. Um, tax planning is a difficult one because they're employed by the client to mitigate their tax liabilities, so that's their job, but it does need to be balanced with the public interest and the new IESBA code provisions that are coming in fairly soon will at least now require them when they're doing that sort of work to, to talk, take a step back and just say, okay, that's in line with the law, you know, we, we can get Starbucks off paying any tax, but actually is it the right thing to do? And I think that's a really good change that they're making to the, the ethical code. Touching on ethics and sustainability, greenwashing. Greenwashing is great. If anybody can tell me what greenwashing is, please do, because it's not really well defined. Some examples on here, clear examples, manipulating the data, Volkswagen emissions of a few years ago that spread across the whole industry. That was clearly greenwashing. Um, overstated claims and adverts. So there was an Austrian airport recently that got hauled over the coals for claiming it was net zero, which was great, only what they didn't do was take account of the fact that planes fly in and out of it. So itself, it might have been net zero, but really trying to claim an airport's net zero today is bunkum at best. Um, over positive reporting, and that's about the balance of reporting, and not green, not a greenwashing example, but way back in the baby pee and herring game, was that the early 2000s? Something like that. Um, I don't know if people in the room remember, it was a horrific case where, where a baby died and social services didn't necessarily cover themselves in glory. We were the auditors, we got the annual report, and the first sentence of the Haringey annual report said, this has been another hugely successful year for the London Borough of Haringey, at which point we gave it back and said, no, you go back and change that. So it, it's not a greenwashing example yet, but it does happen in annual reports all the time. And use of text and imagery, it's interesting, somebody was telling us recently um, that they've got a client that does a sustainability report and when they want a nice message, it's in, it's in green text. I mean, how obvious is that? How green can you be? They put it in green text. But also they said Shell's annual report and the sustainability section, there's not a picture anywhere in there of an oil well or a drill or anything like that. Lots of lo lovely pictures of trees and um, wind farms and solar panels, but nothing to do with oil, which is really not balanced. Oh, that's the tax specialist again. Um, and then just in terms of some other ethical challenges around sustainability, um, the integrity piece, you know, I've touched on fair balanced reporting, but reporting in line with the reporting standards and making sure you're reporting everything. Um, the, the chances of people leaving things out is, is quite high. Um, a key in, in, in all of that is going to be balancing stakeholder needs. In, a, in an accounts audit, it's relatively straightforward. The people that care are the shareholders or the owners. Um, but actually, when it comes to sustainability, every man and his dog wants to know uh, what's going on, and, and there'll be lots and lots of stakeholders who are very interested in what we're doing. Um, objectivity, and this, this is from the preparer side, the bias, again, here's bias again, um, the potential for bias in present, presenting the data, so doing it in green text and all that kind of stuff. Critically reviewing information that they get from other people. So in sustainability reporting, you have to, to report all up and down your supply chain, uh, and your value chain, um, and, and will people just take the information they're given at first value and put it in, who knows? Um, and auditor independence is a potential issue, where, especially where we've advised somebody in the lead up to reporting. And then professional due care and competence, everyone's an expert, it's great. I saw someone on LinkedIn the other day, it said global sustainability leader, and I thought, oh, I wonder who they work for as the global sustainability leader, they don't. They, they just self-proclaimed global sustainability leader, so I thought that's an interesting one, I might change mine to that. Um, but 
you know, everybody is an expert in sustainability at the moment. It's quite easy to pretend you are. Um, but obviously, we do need to be if we're going to put ourselves up and claim that we are. And, and there's a lot to understand when it comes to sustainability and, and the reporting standards. And I'll just leave you with this. Um, I, I shamefully photographed this in a presentation that I was at last week because I think it's brilliant. Uh, just the first sentence, I sent it to my teenage son who doesn't believe me. But accountants might be the one last hope for life on earth. And I thought, if that doesn't give you a sense of purpose for the rest of your career, I don't know what does. The rest of it's all wiffly waffly wordy stuff. But I'll just leave you with that. We, we are the last hope for life on earth. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Paul, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight on what is quite an important topic. Uh, in terms of background, mine's perhaps not quite as colourful as, as Paul's, but I did qualify as a SIPFA member a number of years ago uh, and have had the pleasure of working both inside and outside of the public sector, so uh, it, 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 it is a portable qualification. Um, the exam question tonight for us is how do we create honest accountants? And whilst preparing for this, I had to think to myself, is that the right starting point? And the reason I say that is I think I've known thousands of accountants in my time. Um, they're not all interesting, by the way. Uh, but <coughs> I'm confident that all of them start with absolutely the right morals, values and ethics. Um, I've never ever met one whose intention was to start out as a dis dishonest accountant. Um, but I have to accept, and uh, evidence supports this assertion, that a number turn out that way. Quite how big uh, that number is is an interesting one, and the cheap response would be um, it's tiny. The CCAB, Consultative Committee for Accountancy Bodies, which runs the uh, or collates the UK accountancy bodies, estimates that in the uh, counting bodies uh, in the UK, there are about 275,000 accountants and possibly around 415,000 uh, internationally. And given those numbers, which are fairly sizable, the chances of somebody doing something naughty are actually quite likely. So, you know, I think we've just got to accept that there's a truism here and, and maths, maths supports that. So why don't I just sit down and say it's going to happen, let's accept that. Well, you can't do that, can you? For a number of the reasons Paul, Paul talks about. Um, um, <clears throat> what, what can we do to stop them going bad? And, and th there are various lines of defence that I'd just like to, to talk about here now. And the first point, I think, is we have to rely on those initial values of the individual accountant, uh, that person. Uh, most professions, if not all, have this as their first line of defence, the Hippocratic Oath being a, perhaps, perhaps a good example of that. And I think that the, the number of dishonest accountants kind of suggests that as a first line of defence, that's a reasonably effective one. Um, but it's not wholly effective, is it? The second line of defence, I would contend, should be the organisation that they are accounting on behalf of. And I, I'll, I'll keep the, the auditing uh, argument out of this. Um, all accountants have got a duty to ensure that, uh, and organisations have got a responsibility to make sure that the internal control mechanisms are thorough and designed to protect those, individu those individual organisations, be they on behalf of shareholders or residents or service users or tenants or, or whatever. Um, and that those mechanisms have got to be strong enough to prevent fraud, fraud occurring. Uh, <clears throat> Internal controls are often seen in organisations as an impediment and a barrier to progression. And when I worked in the commercial sector, uh, as, as the accountant, I was, you know, I, you're stopping us making money. Well, not quite sure I see it like that. Perhaps the corollary of Paul's example about uh, uh, another one I've had people, you know, if you don't let me do this, Gareth, kids will die, you know. So a bit of a, bit of a cheap shot, that one, but it, but it has happened. Um, I think the third line of defence and a responsibility which not everybody acknowledges, but I think it's absolutely there, is, is the role of management in an organisation. Um, of course, it's linked to the exercise of internal control. I get that. Um, and the textbooks would probably say the same sort of thing. Um, but good management identifies and highlights and pushes and probes 
those areas that aren't quantifiable. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> Paul talked about the role of auditors. Do you know what? You can't beat your gut feeling as an auditor. You can't beat the sniff test as a manager. And I think uh, we've all got those, uh, those non-quantifiable things that we can exercise to, to ensure that ethics are maintained. Um, finally, um, and I, I will include auditors in this because I do think they have a role, but there's the role of the regulator in uh, all of our society. Um, they're usually designed to protect the stakeholder in whichever sector that might be. Uh, and in the public sector, of course, that's the general public or, or the service user. Um, the world is littered, littered with regulators and that, you know, there ought to be a profession for regulation because there's an awful lot of them. Um, every single service you can think of, there's a regulator. Um, they range in size, scale and frankly, usefulness. Uh, just to go off piste slightly, I used to chair a multi-academy trust in the Midlands. It, uh, we had 18 schools, we turned over 60 million quid, uh, 10,000 pupils, 1,200 staff. So, you know, sizable assets of 160 million, sizable, sizable organisation. Um, and it was quite right that an organisation spending and responsible for that scale of public money, but more importantly, the education of our kids, was regulated. I've got no contention with that. Um, the range and number of regulators, the Education and Skills Funding Agency, Ofsted, Office of Qualifications, the Health and Safety Executive, the Charity Commission, the Local Authority, Companies House, is too many. So I think they, they dilute and undermine the concept of regulation because there are just too many of them. And frankly, too much money is spent on them. But what's more, even more invidious is the role of the regulator becomes the more important thing for those in individuals. In this case, what should be paramount for a school is teaching kids. It wasn't always the case. It was how can we keep Ofsted ready? Rant over. <clears throat> um, the accounting world is similarly complex, similarly complex. We talked about the FRC, there's the FRB, um, Financial Reporting Council, uh, uh, it, 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 it goes on. Um, but you see, you dismiss those and you ignore things like the ethics code, which is too long. It's, it can't, a document of that length cannot be useful. Um, uh, as Paul mentioned, each of the six accountancy bodies, we, we have our own uh, ethics codes. They are a variation on a theme. Um, and I'll, I'll um, the but the usefulness of some of those, I think, has been tested of late. And I'll, I'll, I'll restrict my com comments to the public sector because that's the one I know best. Um, uh, <coughs> in the in SIPFA terms, if a member does something wrong inside or outside of the work environment, and that is important, then uh, society should expect action. Uh, for those of you that follow local government, you'll have seen over the uh, recent years there's been a, a number of very high profile cases where things have gone wrong. Um, and we, we haven't been successful as a profession of persuading the populace that those ethics gets translated and the reg role of the regulator or the professional body has been good at preventing those. <coughs> um, local government's had its bad a fair share of bad publicity. Uh, you, know, you talk about the Wokings, we talked about Birmingham City Council, largest local authority in Europe, got its, got its financial problems. The one I know best of all, because I was uh, seconded to be their finance director at the beginning of the year, was Thurrock Council, uh, and uh, a spectacular failure of almost every single form of regulation, governance, control, and frankly, ethical behaviour. How many people have been called to account for that? Uh, at the moment, I'm cheap shot this one because I know some things are ongoing, nobody. Um, uh, the, the reliance on the ballot box in that instance to, uh, to, to sort out the politicians that were involved didn't really work. There is, uh, there is an accountant who, um, frankly, if the ethics code had a chapter on gross stupidity, he would have been hung on quarter for now, but it, but it doesn't. So. Um, we work in a subjective area with things like valuations, which are really, really difficult to quantify at times. So trying to apply the concepts of natural justice when 
with the application of professional judgment is a really tricky one. And you know what? We haven't got it right. Um, so I suppose on the back of that, I'm slightly surprised at, uh, at Graham's comment that only one in five don't trust us because actually, you know, we possibly deserve to do better for society than, than we probably are. Um, so in summary, I would contend that the vast, vast majority of accountants are actually honest and trustworthy and society is better for that, for that honesty and transparency. And, you know, I'm not entirely convinced the world will fall apart, but I do get the argument um, w without that. Um, but when things do go wrong and individuals do go rogue, we haven't quite got it right in terms of correcting that. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, oh, I better use the microphone. Uh, lovely to see you. Uh, and I also had the chance to have some conversations earlier. Big thanks to Graham, uh, who is a, a great ambassador for education in accountancy and a strong believer in students and their curiosity and satisfying that curiosity. Uh, I think it's so important, so important in a world which has, especially in business, has become very much top down, where the kind of the academics uh, define the curriculum, uh, they decide the fees, you know, 30,000 for an MBA minimum in this country, 30,000 uh, pounds. So that puts ethics out of the window, really, because, you know, students say, oh, I want to make sure that I return that when I get out. So there are lots of issues and uh, really uh, students uh, need to be important. You are the future. You are the future leaders of the profession uh, and uh, it's so important that you engage. I had some amazing conversations earlier when I was trying to gauge your thinking about ethics and some of you were very cooperative uh, and gave me your thoughts very quickly, you know, very instinctively. And I could see that there is a conscience, there is a concern and there's even a faith. Some, some people mention their religion and belief, which nobody talks about when it comes to accounting ethics, but I will. So uh, let me, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So this is kind of my latest book. Uh, I've written a number of books on ethics. Uh, and this is the latest one, uh, which came out, and I've been promoting it all over the world. I'll talk about the research for that. But these are the kind of books I've written. Uh, these are all research monographs, uh, and I've written many research articles and papers. I have a PhD from the LSE. I'm a chartered accountant also. I qualified with the big four, with KPMG. Uh, so I have practical experience as well. And uh, I have been brought up in a particular culture, in a mindset, which uh, by coincidence turns out to, be, uh, have, to have a long tradition in accounting. I actually say, joke, that we have 2.4 accountants per family in my culture. I'll tell you a little bit more about the culture. But when I research it, I realize actually there's a reason why we have so many accountants in our culture, and I'll tell you a little bit more later. But uh, yeah, so I've written a book on reinventing accounting and ed uh, 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 finance education for a caring, inclusive, and sustainable future. So I care about students and education. And I uh, have many of the examples in that book are actually those that I've used in my classroom. I've written a book about the largest ever corporate failure in British history, the bankruptcy of HBOS Bank uh, in 2008, 52 billion pounds. And I looked at what was the cause of that failure. And of course, ethics was a big part of it, but it was also very political. Uh, I've written a book about my culture and its own theory of finance. It's called the Jain culture, and the book is called Jainism and Ethical Finance with Aidan Rankin. Uh, it's the one of the oldest living cultures of the world. In the Queen's Jubilee, there was a big poster somewhere in central London about Jainism saying it's the oldest religion of the world. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and the latest one, Inclusive and Sustainable Finance, Leadership, Ethics, and Culture, is actually what I would call a multi-faith, multicultural perspective on ethics in accounting and finance. So it's a really global panoramic view. 
But the centering is very different. If you looked at the earlier talks, they were all talking about ethical codes and ethical rules. Whereas the way I center ethics is I center it around culture, tradition, wisdom, and diversity. Right? So it's a very different way of looking at ethics. And I think that's also why the world has gone so wrong with ethics, especially in accounting and in banking and finance. So I'll tell you a little, I'll justify that statement with some examples. I, you know, just as I, what I said about education, I'm very keen to engage with the grassroots community. So, you know, as an academic, when you spend a lot of time thinking sort of big ideas, reading kind of complex books and sorting out complex equations, you lose the language of the people. But to me, that's very important to be grounded. And in fact, one of the problems of accounting and finance is it has become very ungrounded. We have lost touch with the ground, with people on the ground and their experience, their feelings, and their exploitation and expropriation. So I do a weekly column for iGlobal, which is free and online and available to any of you. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, social uh, uh, capital, ethics, and business. So th sorry. Ah, can you hear me now? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. So this is the latest book, and there's a QR code, so you can uh, uh, take a picture if you want. Um, but just to give you an example, the title, Leadership. I put the subtitle Leadership there. You open any textbook in finance, you won't even find the word leadership in the index. Same thing with a textbook in accounting. Virtually, the word leadership will not even be in the index. Forget about the table of contents, not in the index. There are thousands of books on leadership. But when it comes to what good leadership in accounting and finance looks like, there's total silence. Why? Why do you think that is? There's a reason for that. And the reason is that good leadership in accounting and finance has to start and end with ethics. And ethics is directly in conflict with greed and profit maximization and wealth maximization. So instead of dealing with the crooks of the problem, we paper over it, we ignore it, we hope it will go away. But of course, the scandals don't go away. And you just have to read the, the press. And the worst example are the leaders. It's the leaders who set the tone of the organization, the leaders who behave in a very greedy way, leaders who set their own pay, salaries, bonuses, incentives, etc. And they are the ones who destroy banks like HBOS because they do, all they care about is themselves. And then they just try and uh, you know, create systems and processes for others to act as their slaves. So leadership is very critical. Um, ethics, culture. Culture is the canvas of life. Culture is, culture is what helps us to build experiences about morality. What a, all of us have some aspect of culture. We are, the way we are brought up, the town, the, you know, we heard some stories, the town, the locality, all these things influence how we think and how we behave. How dare be, how dare that it is not relevant to your ethical behavior? It's completely relevant to your ethical behavior. And that culture may have a mix of faith and belief and language and background, the country you're born in, the country you're living in, all kinds of components will make a mix of that culture. But that shapes who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in. And therefore, that's where the ethical conversation ought to start. And that's also where different cultures can meet and contrast with one another and come to understand where they, what they believe and how they believe it. Now here's a, I have never seen this before. In fact, I didn't even notice this, even though I've visited India many times. But on the back of the Indian rupee note, there are 17 languages, 17 translations of the, the number of that note. So, uh, so here, for, uh, for example, it's a 2,000 rupee note. So there are 17 languages in which 2,000 rupees is expressed. So the real truth about accounting and finance 
is that it is extremely diverse all over the world. In the same family, you might have two different people having a different attitude to money. One might be wanting to get rich very quickly and the other one might be wanting to be a school teacher so that they have a basic salary but they actually enrich other people's lives. Right? So what happened then? Why are we getting all this fraudulent accounting education which tries to give us just one approach to accounting standards, one approach to accounting calculation, one approach to banking, one theory of the firm. Where did all that nonsense come from? I, I want you to ask your professors that question because it is really, I mean, even today I was on the campus for a couple of hours. The huge diversity of people in the campus is not represented in our textbooks, especially in accounting and finance, and ought to be. Now, I bet many of you have done A-level economics. And in A-level economics, it's actually a very religious book. A -level, the textbook of A-level economics is very religious, except that they don't, you won't find the word religion anywhere. And the religion is the religion of greed and uh, money and wealth and happiness. And this is caged as science. So this is how your minds have been molded even before you came to university. Not right. Totally fraudulent and this is why are we then surprised that there are so many scandals. So this is where you have to challenge. And this is why the challenge has to go to the roots. There is so much research. There's a book called Effluenza, which looks at the lives of rich people. And I tell you, if you read that, they are the most miserable people on the planet. They may have billions, you know, broken marriages, drugs, alcohol, all kinds of, you know, stories. Yeah. So this is the reality. So you don't necessarily need to be greedy and selfish to be happy. So I go deeper and actually say that the science of economics is one of the reasons why we have such a global warming crisis. Because it has created institutions, markets, and thinking and power which creates inequality, which destroys animals and nature. Animals is another subject you will not find even in the index of an accounting or finance textbook. But there are many, many more animals than we are on this planet. And they do matter. We know now from the science that if we don't look after them, we will be similar. So economics actually has been directly a chainsaw on nature and society. Nature, animals, and society. So when we are talking about fixing this world, we have to fix that very science from the bottom up. And none of us, there is so much greenwashing, even the Scientists are all trying to paper over. The social sciences are equally culpable in damaging this planet and creating and promoting inequality. So you really need to go to the bottom of the thinking of these sciences. Here's a statistic which I bet very few of you ever knew. But we kill, there's seven billion of us and we eat 400 billion a year. So what we've done is we have industrialized our food system. We have used the idea of economies of scale to mass produce food. And in the case of animals who are emotional beings like all of us, just because we want to eat them, we've just put them through the factory system. Why? People have always eaten meat, but do you need to do it through a factory system? 
look at the pain. Are we, isn't, aren't, uh, isn't there pain and suffering the revenge we are getting today with global warming? So if just as we are talking about stopping oil, we need to stop the factory production of meat urgently if we are to repair this planet. And that's beyond accounting and finance, but also a part of it because accountants need to step up to their leadership responsibilities. So this is our cultural hub here in London. Have any of you been to this place? One. Wow. What's your good name? Rita. Rita. We met before, right? <laughs> you won the LSCA award for student body of the year. At pass. Oh yeah, that's where I'm. PQ, PQ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we met. Yeah. So this is a culture where finance is in the DNA, and there's a long tradition of that. So when it's a part of a tradition and a community and a culture, what happens is from childhood you start to hear the words, the language, you see the behaviors of how to look after other people's money, how to look after your own money, how to invest it widely, how to save, how to keep an account of it, etc. So that's why we have 2.4 accountants. We are a small community, but we are a community of some of the best accountants in the world. And I can give you a lot more evidence apart from me. So then what's the finding of my research? Right. The finding is that actually leadership in accounting and finance has four main components, culture, belief, character, and risk. And by risk, again, I don't mean that probability calculation. I mean the attitude to risk. The ability to take risks. Right. So this is a very radical new theory of accounting and finance. And I interviewed many leaders to do the research of my book, and, uh, but we completely need to rethink our whole approach to the core. Money is a cultural and social construct. Birds don't need money to fly or to eat or to sing. It's us. We are the only species in the world to have created this thing called money. And what has happened? This thing which is supposed to help us in everyday life has become our master, right? And we have now lost total control of money and money is controlling us, right? Money is dominating our life. How dare we? How, how dare we allow that to happen? And once it has happened, all we say is, oh, we need more money or we need more Bitcoin or we need more we are unwilling to take the challenge saying, no, we will take the genie back into the bottle and make sure money serves us rather than us become slave, becoming slaves to money. So I have had to, now remember, I was like you 35 years ago when I started my teaching or my training in accountancy. And of course, none of my culture, nobody even asked me about what my belief was in my London School of Economics uh, studies, uh, even up to master's and PhD, which I later did after becoming a chartered accountant. Yeah. And of course, in the books, there are these equations and calculations. And of course, religion, oh, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it in the classroom. You can keep your belief to yourself but don't talk about it. But the real world is affected by religion, whether we like it or not. It's just a fact, right? If you look at the history of the English legal system, it's based on Christianity. And that has become almost a global legal system. So there are all kinds of connections with religion, but also people may have beliefs, right? So I have had to rewrite the language of finance. And it's taken me 30 years to do that. 
I've got rid of all the equations and the rubbish, and I start with morality, I go into tradition, I put community at the center of finance, go into experience, what is it that shapes who you are and why that matters, and finally purpose. Right. So now, after rewriting this language, you can build, you can use this language to build your own theories of accounting and finance and your knowledge base and use your own self, your identity, your beliefs, your culture to peg your understanding of what matters in terms of your future and your career. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Right, thank you very much. Um, so my name's Stephen Geit. I uh, worked with Paul several, s several years ago. Decades. <laughs> they, can they can hear me. Um, so before I worked with Paul, I actually worked for a local authority. I trained um, after leaving school, left school with A-levels, went straight to work for a local authority, and I trained and qualified through the AAT and then through SIP for rather than going through university. It was a time when not everybody went to university, wasn't it, really, when we kind of were trading. Um, so I, I worked in a local authority, Derbyshire County Council, for about 10 years. And at that point, after I qualified, I then joined KPMG in Manchester in their public sector audit team. So I've kind of worked on both sides of that trust equation. So I've been the less trusted auditor and I'm now back to being a more trusted accountant, which <laughs> perhaps I was a few years ago. So, so I've come back to being on the trusted side. Um, and then I worked in, at KPMG for about, uh, about 17 years overall and I kind of didn't work in public sector audit quite as long as Paul. I moved into the audit technical team at KPMG and then from there I moved into learning and development, audit learning and development. Then from KPMG I actually went and worked at CITFA as a, a tutor for a number of years and then joined Crow as their head of learning and development and worked with a lot of the students as they join the firm working through their training program. And now I'm a freelance trainer, tutor, work uh, with a range of different organisations delivering training, mainly to trainee accountants, coaching trainee accountants who are on an apprenticeship programme. So I very much want to think about how do we create an ethical accountant from the perspective of you. So I want to ask a few questions. So, a little bit of an audience interaction here. So how many of you would say that you were honest? Okay. It depends. It depends. <laughs> Why does it depend? Why does it depend? Am I, I'm going to have to come up to, with the microphone so that we can hear. Yeah. Oh, it depends. Why it depends? Uh, well, I'd say that all oh, those pictures, well. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't let that stop. There, there, was, there was an instinct answer. So we say that I, I feel honest, but then sometimes honesty can drive okay. you towards the wrong path. Okay. Uh, and so, so it, what, it's not a, so not talking about dishonesty. It's why like holding the the holding the honesty back. You want to protect someone or something, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm trying to think of an example, but I can't. Okay. <laughs> That's very honest that you were honest enough to say <laughs> that. How about you guys? We had some hands up here. Guy in the red jumper. I mean, I put my hand up to say I was honest, so... Are you not really honest? Um, I think 99% of the time, but like you said, I think there's instances when we rationalise dishonesty yeah. and think that actually it's perhaps more, more moral and ethically good to be dishonest or to withhold information, but broadly honest. Yeah. 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 I think it's fair to say we've all told a little white lie occasionally, isn't it? Paul, you've probably told a white lie occasionally. Yeah? Yeah? Has anybody, will anybody admit to telling a white lie and sharing what, go on. I'm gonna have, oh, hang on, the guy in front here has got his hand up. What was your white lie? If someone has cut you a meal, and they ask you how it was, and it wasn't the best. <laughs> That's a really good white lie. Yeah, I think we've all done that to friends, Can you be too honest? Colleagues. Honest. Can you be too honest? I think you can be too honest, can't you? What do you think? 
I don't can you? think I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, but, what? But there are consequences also. Yeah, there are consequences of being too honest. There are consequences of not being honest, aren't there? There are consequences which often mean you get caught out and those things, those lies catch up with you at some point. So what to you does being honest mean? What does being honest mean? What does it mean to you? Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. Anybody else? Being straightforward. So it links back to some of those ethical principles that Paul talked about. Integrity, honesty, confidentiality, professional behaviour. So honesty is kind of quite a broad type of uh, headline, but actually being ethical involves being honest, doesn't it? It be means being truthful, being straightforward. So what sort of things would stop you from being honest. Why might you say that meal was not cooked so well or didn't taste so good? Why might you not say that? Um, might hurt people's feelings. Might hurt people's feelings, yeah. So it goes back to maybe wanting to protect people, so you perhaps say things, or maybe you don't say things to protect people. You know, when you have kids, sometimes you don't tell your kids things because you know they'll get upset and they'll get distressed about it. So we all have those little elements of where we're perhaps not as honest as we could be to protect people's feelings, to protect, to protect ourselves from difficult questions sometimes. That happens at home. That also happens in business life as well. So I'm sure that you guys have kind of had those situations where, is that my phone maybe that's causing that? Um, so we've all had those situations where we perhaps are a little bit more economical with the truth, which, as we saw in some of the things that Paul talked about, some of the things that uh, Gareth talked about, and some of the things that Atul talked about, we have situations where we might overstate something to embellish something, or we might not be quite so, we might be a little bit more economical with the truth. So there are some really, um, really good examples um, that I'm just going to talk about. Paul talked about Carillion from the auditor's perspective, but I'm going to talk about it perhaps more from the leadership perspective and the perspective that Atul mentioned. And Carillion obviously was a huge corporate failure a number of years ago. And whilst we look at it in terms of the collapse and the, and the impact that it had on the audit firms, we also need to think about what happened within the organisation. And so there's been a, a lot, of, lot of review and consideration of what happened there. But one of the things that I often look at when I'm going back and having a look at notes around Carillion is I have a look at the scrutiny that was performed by a parliamentary committee a few years ago. And there's a comment in, in there that talks about once the business had completely collapsed, Carillion's directors sought to blame everyone but themselves for the destruction that they caused. Their expressions of regret offer no comfort for employees, former employees and suppliers who've suffered because of their failure of leadership. So that highlights how, you know, ultimately the leaders of that organisation were perhaps led by greed, aggressive accounting policies, trying to get more out of it for themselves. But then there's a comment a little bit later that I, I, I'll pick out, and it talks about one of the finance directors. There were three finance directors that were, were impacted by or, or involved in that collapse at the time. And it re reads about the, uh, the finance director that was, was the last one, the only Carillion director to emerge from the collapse with any credit. She demonstrated a willingness to speak the truth and challenge the status quo. Fundamental qualities in a director that were not evident in any of her colleagues. The fact that it was a woman and all the others were men maybe says something, I don't know. But it kind of highlights how one person in all of that scandal appears to have actually come out with a little bit of credit for doing the right thing, challenging things, actually standing up for something similar to the, the sort of situation that Paul found himself in. Okay. Has anybody heard about the KPMG director who 
claimed £500,000 on expenses. You know? Basically claimed £500,000 on expenses over a period of time and was discovered. So again, someone who perhaps people put their trust in working for KPMG, big international brand, very well established firm, although perhaps after Carillion and a few other things maybe, maybe they shouldn't have that uh, reputation they have. But you know, this was a director who, who basically fraudulently claimed expenses. Someone who you would expect you could trust, ultimately lost his job. He was then sent down for about four years. He was given a four year sent custodial sentence. So lost his job. We've also got, you've all heard of Patisserie Valerie. Yep, the FD there who committed fraud. And then there's another one, another example of professional behavior. And this is, this is one that happened probably about 15 years ago. It was a young accountant who tweeted about the fact that, um, and this was a woman as well, she tweeted about being in a car driving past a, motor, uh, past a cyclist at such speed that the cyclist was basically forced into a hedge. That's outside work, but ultimately, again, an example of professional behaviour outside the work environment. And they ultimately also lost their job because they were seen as someone who behaved poorly. They tarnished the reputation of the firm. So it all ultimately comes down to a whole range of different examples and scenarios. But why is it so important for honest accountants to be honest? What are the sorts of things that accountants do which is why we expect them to be honest. Let me come and ask a few volunteers. I'm gonna come a bit further. Don't worry, Graham, I'm not coming to you. How about you? Why do you think we need accountants to be honest? Um, I think it's crucial for our economy to keep growing and to make sure that there is a competitive market in the, in the capital sense that okay. everyone follows the same rules and competes on equal ground. Okay. You? I think the economy is one aspect, but actually we represent individuals at a kind of stakeholder level. I'm an auditor, okay. so um, <laughs> kind of, you know, my You're not as trusted as me. No. <laughs> <laughs> my interest is the shareholders, okay. and their money being protected and put to best use. So effectively an accountant is a steward. Yeah. An auditor is a steward. Yeah. They, they'll, they review what the stewards, the accountants are doing. So if we think back to a little bit before we get to the point of the global markets and things like that. What do accountants actually do? Well, they record transactions. Every payment, every piece of income, every judgment is recorded by the accountant. So it's important that they record those accurately. You know, the KPMG director who claimed fraudulent expenses, he wasn't recording his transactions accurately. Well, he was. They just weren't being recorded quite as correctly or accurately as, you know, that might be his justification. Um, effectively, what he was doing was he was claiming expenses that were not business expenses. They were personal expenses. And he justified it because he did a lot of international travel. <laughs> okay, so what he was doing was paying for flights that were not business flights and they were kind of all been mixed in with all of his other travel expenses. So if we think about accountants and what they actually do, they record transactions. What do they then do once they've recorded those transactions? They present them in a set of financial statements, okay? They present them to the, stu to the users. That might be the shareholders. It might be the, you know, the local taxpayer. So we expect accountants to present those financial statements, that summary of those transactions, in a true and fair way. We expect the accounts to be truthful to represent the financial affairs of a business or an organisation. And what we also expect accountants to do is to evaluate information. So we ex people expect them to take information, analyse it, evaluate it and provide an opinion on it. That might be an audit opinion. It might be a piece of advice, tax advice, financial planning advice. Okay investment advice. So we need accountants to be honest because ultimately we're relying on that, a lot of their information. Okay. So when we think about the rules and regulations and things that exist, do we think those are enough 
or do you think we can do more? So based on what you've heard so far tonight, what do you all think? Who thinks we can do more? Okay, I'm going to come back up, right up to the top this time, I'm trying to get my steps in for the day. What more do you think we can do? Um, right, um, I think regulations are enough, but it's the implementation of the regulation that matters more. You can have as many rules as you want, but if people aren't following them, if people don't value them or actually realise the importance of them, then there's no point having those regulations. Yeah. So I think this comes back to the point about you know having CPE training, etc., every year to like kind of implement and show people why ethics matters for us sometimes it's the fact you see a big full name in the newspapers which reminds me you oh yeah this is why regulation matters you know these are the kind of like reminders that you need but you shouldn't have to see a big four headline yeah. to remember that oh this is why you need ethics yeah yeah that's a really good way of looking at it that actually it's about awareness of those rules and regulations is important that's the first stage isn't it awareness of the rules i have to be careful because i could easily tumble down here um, awareness of the rules and regulations is important and then actually knowing how to apply them, how to implement them in different circumstances and situations. So actually having guidance and support to implement, which is there and that's all, that's all there. A lot of the firms have that, a lot of the institutes have that. If you're interested, the ICAW have just released a really interesting podcast. don't know whether any of you have seen it why good people do bad things. If you get a chance, have a listen to it. It's about 40 minutes, really interesting. It talks about some really practical issues. And I think you'll find that helpful to consider some different situations. But I think to end the session, I think when we think about how do we create the ethical or the honest accountant, ultimately it all comes down to you. It all starts with you as an individual. So whether there are rules or not, it's about how you implement those rules, your belief systems, your values, your culture, how you apply that in everything you do every day, in work or in personal life. Thank you.